Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines and speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. As concerns grow that the conflict between Ukraine and Russia could turn nuclear, we speak to Krista Victorson, the Director General of the Federal Authority for Nuclear Regulation in the UAE, and a nuclear physicist with more than three and a half decades of national and international experience in nuclear safety, to ask whether the world is ready for nuclear escalation. Plus, how important is collaboration between Saudi Arabia and UAE nuclear officials as Iran continues to press ahead with its nuclear program? And can the two GCC countries set an example for the rest of the world in the production of safe nuclear power? Mr. Victor Sander, thank you for joining us on Frankly Speaking. Now, I know you're heading a federal authority here in the UAE and your mandate is local, but your agency handles nuclear regulation, which, given the recent nuclear threats between Ukraine and Russia, is very relevant. So, frankly speaking, are you personally alarmed? Should we be alarmed? And is the world ready to deal with a nuclear escalation? So, we should all be alarmed by the situation when there is a risk of a nuclear accident. Uh, we all um, work in order to prevent this from happening. We have seen accidents in the past, and uh, they have been catastrophic in nature, many of them, and um, made a lot of damage to the environment and to the public health. Uh, so, of course, we have to be concerned, but we have to be constructive, we have to work together, and we have to find ways to solve these problems. And the IEA Director General has outlined seven pillars for um, nuclear safety, and this needs to be respected. Uh, that is my only comment on this situation. So you say it obviously needs to be respected. We've recently seen comments from the Chechen president, Ramzan Kadyrov. Now, he's come out and said that Russia should use low-power nuclear weapons against Ukraine. So in your capacity as a nuclear expert, what exactly are low-power nuclear weapons and can their damage really be contained? So I wouldn't wish to comment. We have no responsibility concerning nuclear weapons. This is uh, an action of war, uh, if you use nuclear weapons. Uh, we are only concerned um, for the civil nuclear power plants. That is my only comment. Okay, well, let's look towards Europe as a whole. Obviously, Europe is facing looming gas supply shortages. And as that is continuing, we're seeing more conversations looking at using nuclear energy as a substitute. So in your opinion, how quickly or how widespread could we see that being adopted? And how has the technology evolved in terms of safety since the days of Chernobyl? So nuclear safety in general has improved significantly since Chernobyl. It improved further after the Fukushima accident. Um, so many safety enhancements have been done. Um, so the nuclear technology is being considered by more and more countries. That is what we see all around the world. And in the UAE, we have introduced now three reactors already who are connected to the grid. And the fourth one uh, is coming. Um, and um, this is, of course, to, to limit the emission of CO2 to the environment. Uh, and I think we all should support the development of technology that makes the world more sustainable. Um, so um, the, the rapidity of the introduction of nuclear power, that depends. Um, it's, not, it's not a quick fix. Um, if you start to, to build a nuclear power plant and put it in operation, it takes between five and 10 years. Um, if you want to start to the more advanced technology, it might even take longer time. So it is part of a solution, I believe, but it's not the solution only. 
Okay, well, let's talk more widely about safety in this part of the world. Now, back in 2017, we saw the Houthis. They alleged that they sent a missile strike uh, to Baraka, the UAE's only a nuclear power plant. Now, the UAE has obviously refuted this. In February this year, you told Reuters media agency that you were confident that Baraka was well protected. So I wanted to ask you to elaborate on this. How confident are you that the site is completely safe and secure, particularly given some of the recent advancements we've seen in missile and drone technology? So the modern nuclear power plants, including the Baraka in particular, have a very strong physical protection um, that is part of the requirements in the UAE. Um, then, of course, um, the physical protection um, is, is, is built into the plant, but it's the, the, the entire country needs to play together for, to, to ensure physical protection of a nuclear power plant. And um, there are other authorities involved in, in, in protecting um, infrastructures in the country than, than FANR. What are some of the cybersecurity uh, measures you've taken at FANR to make sure the site is completely safe? For the cybersecurity, we, we have the same regulatory mandate as from physical security. So we issue regulations, we do inspections, uh, and we do testing and drills in order to make sure that the protection from attacks are there at the Baraka nuclear power plant. And how confident do you feel about that protection, uh, protection today as it stands? I am very confident. Um, uh, and if I were not, I would issue new regulatory requirements or re requirements. And we do inspections all the time. We follow uh, international developments. We hire the best international experts in order to support this um, very rapidly evolving area, though. OK, well, let's talk about some regional uh, collaboration. We've seen the UAE and Saudi Arabia have been working to strengthen collaboration ties when it comes to the regulation of nuclear energy. Of course, we saw UAE officials tour Saudi Arabia's nuclear research reactor project in, um, in Saudi Arabia at the King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology, which, of course, is under construction. What do you think the two countries can learn from each other? A lot. Um, we can learn a lot from each other. Um, we have um, had cooperation agreement now with the, um, the regulatory authority in Saudi Arabia, and we have been visiting them and they have been visiting us and uh, we meet regularly in order to share information. And we share information on monitoring, we share information on siting of nuclear installations, we share information on how to build nuclear installation, how to regulate, which types of regulations are we needed, that we need to have harmonized regulations, uh, that we can share uh, various types of information, etc. So there are many things to learn from each other practices. I mean, we have in the UAE recently built three reactors and Saudi Arabia is starting to build. So of course, there is a lot of, of interest in common. And the UAE and FANR is willing to share uh, because one of our principles is transparency and openness um, to, to, to civil nuclear technology. And how frequently are those talks going on? When is the next trip or area of collaboration coming up? When do you see that taking place? It depends on needs, but we meet at least once or twice a year. But then in particular workshops, in international conferences, for example, where we, where we share and, and decide on new projects to, to work on. Do you think that the UAE and Saudi Arabia can be a model to the rest of the world in the successful production of safe nuclear power? I hope so. I mean, I think the UAE is already a model and uh, the cooperation between the two countries can, can, could be another model, how two countries next to each other could, uh, could support each other in the peaceful aspects of, of nuclear power. You've obviously brought up peaceful aspects of nuclear power. How important do you think the collaboration is between the UAE and Saudi, given that we've seen nuclear talks with Iran store and given that Iran is continuing on with its nuclear program? Well, I'm only talking about uh, Saudi Arabia and, and, and UAE now. 
and we have um, a close cooperation and uh, it, this cooperation will continue because both sides see benefits of it. Um, so uh, there is certainly a, an interest that we tighten our cooperation, we share information, we show what type of issues we have had, what type of, of, of um, lessons we have learned from regulating nuclear power, etc. That is what we are con going to continue to do. And how important do you think those talks are? Obviously, in looking at being able to protect and uh, protect and produce safe nuclear power, but also guarding against some of these regional threats. Uh, well, I think lessons um, are to be learned, and um, we need to be open and share this type of information um, in in the region, as we see in other regions of the world. There are a lot of openness and discussions and cooperation between regulatory authority. And this is something that we are introducing now, also in this region. It's, it's, it's of great, great benefit. What would you say the biggest lesson to be learned is in your experience here? That, um, that we are open, that we tell each other about events that happens and what we can learn from these events because um, this is how we can improve safety. If we analyze events that, uh, that have happened and draw the lessons learned and then share it with others, other countries. Now, safety is also a big priority regarding nuclear waste disposal. Bill Gates spoke at Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week recently and he praised the UAE's nuclear progress, but said that safety would be key for nuclear development. Now, he said the region could lead the way by developing new nuclear fusion reactors that are, and I quote, inherently safe and whose economies are significantly lesser than what we have today. So how do you see that being developed here? Well, safety is important in all aspects of nuclear power. Um, and uh, we have um, applied this principle from the very beginning in the UAE. We have the, the nuclear policy that was issued by the government in, in 2008. It emphasized that the UAE is going to comply with the highest international standards in safety, security, and non-proliferation. And we have implementing that in the siting of, of Baraka nuclear power plant. We have uh, assessed the site that it's safe. We have uh, supervised the construction of the Baraka power plant all the time with our inspectors. We are now supervising the operation. We are also going to supervise the safe disposal of nuclear waste. It's exactly the same principle to make sure that uh, we isolate it from the environment and uh, it doesn't harm the environment nor the human beings. Okay, well, let's talk about some of those policies because you've drafted six regulations on the safe disposal of radioactive waste. Now, obviously, there is uh, the ability to be able to store the spent fuel on site at each unit at Baraka. But what are some of the longer term management strategies that you're looking to put in place? So there are different types of waste coming from a nuclear power plant. There is uh, what we call operational uh, waste which is contaminated with radioactivity clothes and tools uh, and equipment. And they require a certain um, type of, of, of treatment. Um, we call it low and intermediate level waste. This can be stored quite easily uh, and for a rather short time, uh, um, lifetime. Then we have the spent nuclear fuel. That is a different story because um, that is hazardous for, for thousands of years. And we need to make sure that we um, find a system that really can, can take care of this waste. So a lot of research has gone on in, in, in the world and we, have, we are benefiting from all this experience from other countries uh, in the UAE. And uh, the government is working on a policy now for, for um, the, the, the safe disposal of nuclear spent fuel. So uh, tell me so about that policy. What is being looked at? What is being considered then? It depends. There are different options um, in, in used, utilized in the world. But the main thing is that we isolate it from the environment uh, for, for a long time. So we need to find confinements and a site in the country that can um, withstand challenges for a long time. 
and that is what um, what the industry will start research on and uh, we will issue regulations on okay so you're saying the current long-term management plan is to store the radioactive waste in the uae somewhere there is a policy already from 2008 saying that the UAE is going to take a very responsible attitude towards the safety of radioactive waste, the same attitude as for the nuclear power plant. Um, so these um, uh, principles are already there. Government has told us and the nuclear industry, make sure you take care of the nuclear waste um, uh, safely and securely, and in a, in a way that um, uh, support non-proliferation of nuclear material. There was discussion at some stage about potentially exporting some of the radioactive waste to other countries for storage. Is that still being looked at? Is that one of the policies being explored? No, it's um, it's being the, the most, uh, um, uh, uh, most normal or common discussion and reference is that to store it in the country uh, where it is produced. And that is the reference scenario we have had here as well. Um, but there is the decision to be made on this matter is not urgent. Um, we have um, uh, almost 100 years before we need to decide on the final solution for spent nuclear fuel. Uh, so one can imagine that the technology is going to be to, to develop. So we might find smarter way um, of, of taking care of nuclear waste and disposing of in, in the ground. We will see. But the UAE is making sure that we will take care of it in a safe manner um, and in order to make sure that, um, that we, it doesn't damage any environment or human being. Well, the, certainly, the UAE certainly has some big global ambitions when it comes to nuclear power. And I was interested in Bill Gates's comments. As I said, he was recently speaking uh, in Abu Dhabi. And he was saying that the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Qatar should play a major role in helping the world transition beyond oil and looking at investing in different types of cleaner or otherwise carbon free emissions. What role do you see FANA as a regulator playing in that? Well, FANR um, has already showed that it's capable of uh, regulating uh, peaceful nuclear power plants uh, in a way that ensures safety, security and non-proliferation. And we have used a quite novel approach. We have um, uh, had a very close cooperation with the Korean, which we call the country of origin of this technology. And we have utilized the best expertise in, in our review and assessment of the safety of the Baraka nuclear power plant. So this is already a model that um, we are um, showing to the world and we, are, have, um, we have been transparent and uh, we are willing to share with all other countries. And I think this could be a model that, that can bring success. Krista, tell me, when it comes to nuclear safety and being able to monitor what's going on in the site at Baraka, how exactly do you do that? Talk me through the process. Okay, uh, good question. So first of all, we have residence inspectors at Baraka. So they are there face to face with the operator. They walk in the power plant. They observe uh, various types of operations uh, in the control room but also when there are maintenance activities and repair activities. And they report this information to us frequent or daily. We have a, a morning meeting um, every day where we get reports from our um, eight uh, resident inspectors. In addition, we, have, we are a very modern regulator. We have a lot of advanced tools. So in the headquarters, which is um, situated 300 kilometers from Baraka in, inside Abu Dhabi, um, we have um, simulators of this exactly the same type as they have at Baraka. So we train our inspectors on those simulators. Uh, we, can, we can put events that have happened in Baraka on those simulators and see what could have happened. In addition to that, we have um, screens, one for each reactor. I can go and see online what is the type 
of um, operation they have now in, in, in Barak. Are they producing at full power or are they having an event? Um, so this is an instrument which is extremely uh, important. I can see alarms, if they have alarms in, inside the reactor. Um, so this gives us a, a hands-on, um, an online picture of what's happening without being there. Um, and then we, we, if we see something strange, we call our resident inspector and, and they will check. Um, but in general, an, the operator has the requirement and obligation to report if something happened. So it's not for that purpose, but it is of, of, of interest and very important for the oversight, how to, how to, to guide our oversight to have this, all these instruments in place at the headquarters. In addition, we have laboratories. So we measure regularly environmental samples. We measure fish, we measure water, we measure air, we measure sand around Baraka and uh, um, around other, uh, I mean, in the country in general, but particularly around Baraka to make sure that nothing is coming out. Um, and uh, we also calibrate instruments that they use to, in order for to, to measure radiation in the in, in the can, in the plant. And are you looking at any other further collaboration with Korea in the future? Because that's a partnership that has been going on for quite some time. Do you see any other potential areas uh, of collaboration with Korea or other countries that you're looking to as a global example? We have many um, examples. We cooperate not only with Korea. We cooperate also with other countries like France, uh, like US, Canada, and other countries um, for research and development um, and for um, uh, training our um, staff in advanced technology oversight um, and, and, and other things. So it's, uh, it is uh, a system that has been in place since uh, 10 years already. We had the first um, agreement with the Koreans from 2010, and we have worked with them since then in order to learn the technology, in order to learn from them how they did the, the licensing and safety review of the application. And then we have utilized this knowledge, but also utilized um, other types of expertise uh, in, in, in our review of, of Barak and Nuclear Power Plant. Okay, well, let's talk about some of the inner workings of FANA itself, because women have been playing an essential role there for some time. Close to half of your workforce, about 44% of employees at FANA are women. And I know you're also uh, investing a lot in Emirati youth to be able to train them. So tell me about some of the policies that you're putting in place to ensure that our nuclear experts of the future are UAE, are our homegrown heroes, and not just exported expatriate talent. Yes, this is an important aspect to make the capacity um, in the UAE uh, grow um, by, by training uh, and mentoring um, UAE nationals. Um, so we are presently at FANR, 72% Emiratis, and many are already on an expert level, have been trained during many, many years, have been um, on the job training at FAN, being outside the country, in, being working internationally um, and, and gaining expertise. Uh, also being heavily involved at Baraka in inspections and, and safety um, reviews. So this is a, a policy that we have. We have a strong leadership team already comprising um, Emiratis. Um, and concerning women, we have 44% of our workforce are females and uh, very successful ones um, and uh, we strive to have a gender balance in, in FANR because we think it enriches the, the, the work environment. It is uh, important that we, that we utilize all the uh, skills that exist in the country and many of the young um, females and men are very interested to, to, to join FANR and the nuclear industry. They see it as a challenge, they see it as, as a environmental friendly technology. And um, 
um, because I think youngsters today or young people today are very aware of environmental protection and the damage we can uh, make if we emit too much CO2. So we have no difficulties to recruit and we have a very strong capacity building program inside Tanner. We are retaining some of our uh, expats now to, to be mentors. And we have full-time training ongoing every day in the, during the week, every day during every month, every day in the, in the, in the year to train um, Emiratis in, in, uh, in nuclear regulation, in safety, radiation protection, security, safeguards, export import control, waste management, nuclear emergency, uh, preparedness and response uh, and other uh, topics. So this is very important for us. And we have, have a very young workforce uh, in addition. So this capacity building effort that we are doing now will benefit us from long, long time. Um, so, so, so that's why we put a lot of priority. In. So certainly 24-7 monitoring. I'd be interested to hear, because I know you have a number of international guests who come to FANA to have a greater understanding about the production and regulation of safe nuclear power. Tell me about some of those visits. What are experts coming to the UAE for to learn and gain a better understanding about there? There is a big interest uh, to come to, to the UAE because we are building um, a, a very big nuclear power program or a big power plant. It's four reactors of 1400 megawatt. Um, we are a newcomer country. Um, we have built up the regulator and the industry in the last 10 years. Um, and uh, we have been able to, through a smart program uh, management approach, maintain the momentum. Uh, in order to de avoid delays. So as FANR, we have been able through good communication between the regulator and the industry to make sure that we have, we put the priorities right and that we put, um, at, that we react on certain events. So, so this is one of the good lessons learned, I said, for, for anyone that it makes sure you establish a good communication between the regulator and the operator, but respecting each other's roles and responsibility. That is very essential. Um, another interesting feature that we have had in UAE was this, we, we, we uh, built a power plant that had recently been built in Korea. So we could take advantage of what they have done there. And this is a great advantage um, also for the regulator because we could, um, uh, because of the, of the openness of the Koreans, they translated their licensing documents, they gave us training and we advanced very fast in order to learn the technology and learn how to regulate this technology. So this is also an interest that foreign regulators have um, in, in, in when they come here. Uh, and to see how we supervise the safety in general, because they have seen us uh, appearing also in IEA. And uh, many are coming to, to me saying, oh, we are impressed. You are really a model regulator. Um, and, and because many countries are now um, trying to embark on nuclear power, I think they need to learn from, from a country that recently have done so. So when we talk about some of this investment in the future, what role do you see FANA or Baraka being able to play in securing the UAE for decades to come? Do you envision a time where global experts will be coming to train at the UAE to be able to understand their experience um, you know, and solid track record in the production of safe nuclear power? So we have had um, experienced experts training UAE and uh, UAE ex um, uh, nationals in FANR for a long time. And we have some, still some um, here, including myself. Um, and, um, uh, but this, uh, this mix of, of, of international experts is a great benefit um, for, for FANR because we see um, complex technical matters from different um, perspectives. 
we have different backgrounds. We don't only hire um, regulators from, from abroad. We have hired operators. We are hired researchers. And this um, diverse team is, is, is part of the, the success. Um, and many have also worked at international organization. So we have a good, um, um, good view of uh, how is nuclear being regulated in various countries. We have um, uh, agreements with maybe 20 different regulators all over the world in order to learn from them. Uh, and we have participate actively in the IAEA conferences. We are active in, the, in supporting the conventions. Um, UAE has signed and uh, adhered to Convention on Nuclear Safety, Convention on, on Radioactive Waste, Convention on Physical Protection, all the instruments that really are there to support safety, security, and non-proliferation. So that is also one of the model, model aspects of the UAE concerning its nuclear program. So what will be your main focus or priority for FANA in the year ahead? Obviously, we've seen the third unit at Baraka recently come online. That will begin commercial operations in the not too distant future. The fourth unit is still under construction. So what will be your main priorities in the next 12 to 24 months there? So the main priority is the uh, oversight of the operating nuclear power plants at Baraka. So we have three re reactors now producing electricity, and we have um, eight inspectors on, at the site. They are following day-to-day -day operations and report back to the headquarters. We send inspection teams, specialized inspection teams from headquarters to Baraka for certain aspects. Uh, in addition, we are presently reviewing the application for, re for, for re reactor four. Um, so that also requires some effort from our side. Another area which, where we put priority is uh, research and development. We need to make sure that we have um, a good view about future challenges. Um, this type of climate we have, we have hot weather, we have dusty weather, we have um, high salinity in the, in the, in the air. And um, all these things might have an influence on, on the baraka, on the construction. So we need to make sure that we have good skills and good knowledge um, to, in order to, to assess what could happen. So we are doing research in these aspects uh, and in other types of aspects as well um, that relates to, to radio, um, radioactive contamination in the environment, for example. But so they're going to be very busy 12 months ahead. Krista Victorson, the Director General of the Federal Authority for Nuclear Regulation here in the UAE. Thank you for joining us on Frankly Speaking. We appreciate your time today. Thank you.